Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, today's October 10th, 2017, and you're listening to our first Human Factors Cast HFES bonus episode. I'm live here from HFES in Austin, Texas. I'm your host, Nick Rome, and we're joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, hanging out over there. Oh, yeah. It's too bad that I'm not there, but it's glad that I get to get recaps from Mr. Nick Rome about HFES. Man, how's today been? Oh, today was busy, man. We got a lot of stuff going on. Um, but uh, so, so I went... Just a kind of broad overview of my day. I went to the prelim, uh, the the opening session, the opening ceremony, whatever you want to call it. I went to that, the plenary session, um, and uh, listened to a chat from President uh, Nancy Cook. And then I also there the uh, keynote speaker was Ron Davis, and uh, he talked a little bit about police reform. Uh, I do have notes on all these, so we will go <laughs> we'll go through all these in depth or a little bit more depth than just this kind of broad overview. And then I um I went to the uh, I went to a couple panels here, uh, usability testing methodology and system development, and those were both really interesting. And then I ended out the day by going to the poster session. And uh, met with some really nice folks there and talked about some of the exciting student projects coming out of there. So we got a lot to unpack here. This is this is going to be a uh, – to let our listeners know, this is going to be a little bit shorter episode, right? This is a bonus episode. This is a nice, sweet little morsel that we are giving to you guys. There's no <laughs> – if you've been to a conference where you are talking all day with other people and networking, you know that it is hard to talk <laughs> All day and then keep talking. So this is going to be a little bit shorter. Uh, I hope you guys understand uh, <laughs> that you don't expect like a full hour out of this episode. <laughs> For sure. Well, so do you want to just jump through maybe in a chronological order what you experienced, like starting with Nancy Cook's talk? Sure. I think that's a that's a good uh, that's a good way to approach it. So HFES day one, uh, I show up to this opening session and uh, you know. They, they do as they normally do and talk about the uh, HFES organization and they talk about how it's grown. And then, um, and then Nancy Cook, like I said, she, she gave this speech on uh, kind of how to address society's greatest challenges. And last year um, we, they talked about uh, cybersecurity. It's the same type but a different topic. And so, um, the way Nancy kind of broke this down was she was thinking about this in terms of buckets. And they mentioned this last year, I think too, where they talk about sustainability, human health, vulnerability, and the joy of living. And, um, she, uh, she kind of broke it down in terms of, um, you know, where, where we don't see human factors and engineering applications. It's, it's not that they're not there. It's just that we don't understand the problem. And I thought that was a really interesting point that I'd like to unpack a little bit with you, Blake, um, because I think that we do that on a week to week basis on the show a little bit. We, we kind of, um, to pull back the curtain a little bit on the process of how we pick the news stories, we, we kind of go through them one by one and say, is this human factors? And if so, how, why is it? And, uh, you know, we try to push ourselves to get those stories that are, fringe or that may be tangentially related i think and i think that's kind of the beauty of what we do and the challenge too on the show because it's one thing to really dive into just scientific papers that are coming out of the community or getting on things and looking at just their ui but we often tackle like like for the past few months it feels like we've been tackling a lot of like the legislation in relation to self-driving cars and automation and how that'll impact multiple people like at, a, at what you kind of talk about in the notes at like a big systems level uh, but before we dive too much further into that nick you've got these four buckets of points that nancy made and are these from her perspective kind of how that you would tackle the greatest challenges for society you know i don't I don't know. I think they, uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time remembering. Um, and if any of our listeners were there and did hear this, please feel free to chime in on our social media or our Slack. Uh, because I, I wrote these down and I thought I'd remember, but I just do not. And I think it was, um, kind of categorizing 
the types of human factors problems, if I'm remembering correctly. So you have like sustainability problems, you have human health problems, you have vulnerability problems and joy of living or um, sort of these uh, nice to have features. I, I, that's kind of what I'm remembering, but uh, I may be our listeners are listening. Um, please, please write in and, and let us know how wrong I am. <laughs> no, this I mean, was, okay. I, I have to, I have to explain to you. This was this was like first thing in the morning, like and and it was probably like what uh, three o'clock our time. No, couldn't have been that. It was like four o'clock our time, I guess four thirty that I was waking up. So pretty early. Gotcha. Well, yeah, I mean, kind of looking at it and thinking about these broad topics, it looks like these are maybe the four categories like you're talking about that are that encompass the greatest challenges to society. And I can totally see her point about when we don't see the HFE application, we don't really truly understand the problem especially in the last one, the kind of like the joy of living. Like, honestly, I, I think I spend a lot more time looking at how to make something more efficient versus how it's ever like um, enjoyable for somebody to use. And I know this particular kind of like broad topic also gets into like quality of life for uh, the elderly and design in that respect. So it's a, that's a really good point by Nancy Cook. I wish I could have heard the talk, but you've like summarized it great. Yeah, you know what? I think next year I'm going to try to partner with HFES and see if we can't get audio from these talks and uh, present them on the show. I think they're a great opportunity for, you know, no human factors practitioner left behind. I think, you know, that's part of the reason why I do these recaps. But if you, if we can actually get the audio next year, that might be something really special to uh, bring to all of our listeners. Oh, for sure. Yeah, if we can't get a get a little spot to do a live podcast in there. I mean, that would be awesome to do a, uh, a, a real recap of kind of like going through the talking points. But anyway, this is, I think this is a pretty awesome way to do it as well. I, I think so too. So moving on, she, um, she kind of makes this point that we need to take a human systems perspective, right? And uh, she gave the example of a predator control station, and she put up this slide of a predator control, the drones, right? The drones that the military use, um, these uh, predator drones, and, and she put up a slide with all the issues associated with how these operators uh, man these drones, and just some of the notes. I couldn't write them all down, but there was a ton of them, right? There, so there's like six monitors per operator. There's a need for more. There's no decision support, um, and it takes 22 keystrokes to engage autopilot, which I just thought was nuts. Yeah, I mean, if it's taking 22 keystrokes to engage autopilot, I can't imagine, like, other functions such as, like, as far as surveillance or anything else that you would typically think of when you think of a Predator drone. But what really blows me away, too, is there's no built-in decision support because, I mean, the UIs have been being developed for Predators and different types of uh, UAVs for a long time, and I figured that would be something that would be baked in there, especially if, like, DARPA has any kind of say in what goes into some of these UIs. Oh, yeah. yeah, I agree. It was it was pretty shocking to me too. Um but so so her emphasis was on think about these systems, right? Think about um how not just the individual UIs of each of these screens kind of play a role in the operators ability to complete their tasks, but rather how the system as a whole operates. And then she's you know men mentioned Think about the consequences that one UI change or one change in a smaller system might hire the system, right? So if you make a small UI change, it might affect how they do the whole process. Oh, yeah. I mean, that – and it's kind of insane when you think about just u the UAV example, right? Because it is it is truly like a system operating within a system because you, you're, you've got an, uh, an aircraft that's dealing with an entire – sounds like a room of people of operators watching these different monitors doing these different actions but then they're operating within the aviation context so that's a that's like an entire system of rules related to commercial aircraft military aircraft and now down to UAVs so yeah if you're if you're changing UIs or changing processes like that has the ability to affect things all the way up the chain even when you're just flying the aircraft in the actual airspace right so uh, continuing on here, she goes on to talk about how collaborating with other di disciplines is a big part of human factors work. And it's hard to do because you have to communicate about the problem. You have to communicate about 
disciplines. And an example that she gave about communicating across disciplines was something like us as classically trained psychologists, like we um, take probably a year to complete a study with human participants, right? From, from recruitment to, um, to testing and evaluation, all that stuff it takes about a year. Sometimes, sometimes we can, uh, pump them out quite quickly, but sometimes we can't. Um, and she was saying this in contrast to something where, you know, if you were to test, a chemical in a lab, it might take two hours and you run the entire experiment in a cor- in the course of two hours. And so when you're talking about that language, about running a study, it, it differs across the disciplines, right? Oh, most definitely. And I mean, there's always a gap between who you're communicating with too and trying to make them understand the utility of it. Because I think definitely right now, uh, I, I know that you probably experience it and I definitely do, trying to figure out how to integrate the research background that we have into like an everyday business process is really tough because you don't get a year to really regroup participants all that i mean this is like within a matter of a few weeks maybe a few days because of who you have access to how quickly you need things need decisions made like there's just you have to ramp this process up uh, but from sure. Nancy's perspective, does she have any good recommendations of how to deal with kind of communicating both the problem and across disciplines? Well, I'm glad you said that because it almost is like I had that next in the show notes. <laughs> she said, <laughs> yeah, she said, uh, focus on problems, um, make it a problem focus and not so much, um, not so much focus on the interface or the, the human, but try to solve the problem, um, and then go from there. She also said, you know, obviously take the human systems perspective and others that those are kind of the big takeaways of that. Um, she goes into talking about Medellin. Um, and she, it, she called this part of her speech, the tale of two cities, right? It's one city, but basically there's two halves to Medellin where you have the poor half and you have the flourishing side where, um, you know, the poor half is, got a lot of murder and homicide and, and, uh, uh, poverty and, and whatever else you can associate with those types of, um, poor stricken neighborhoods or whatever. And then the flourishing side is obviously something that's doing quite well for itself. It's, it's, uh, it's quite the opposite. And so they are, it's situated on a, a hill, a hillside and, um, you know, it's, it's about two hours away from each other when you're walking down the hill and that, that comes into play a little bit later, but she was talking about this reform project where they, um, put museums and schools and gardens in the poorest neighborhoods and collaborated with gang members to kind of create this graffiti art around the city. Uh, and they even went so far as installing escalators in, uh, the city. So that way, um, you know, by doing all this, they reduced the homicide rate because um, they were they were educating. They yeah, they were educating. They had schools and museums and in, in these neighborhoods, um, they were working with gang members to create a piece of art that they were proud to have in their city. And then tourism increased too to the to the previously most dangerous areas. People were visiting these museums and schools and parks. And then um, they, because of these escalators, I thought this was really neat. They reduced the commute time from two hours to fifteen minutes. Wow, that's an that's an incredible amount of changes in, from just taking like like she mentions a systems perspective, right? Like trying to figure out, okay, we got a problem as far as we want to improve part of the city, and what can we do? And I think really the key thing in this is that collaboration part again, being able to figure out how to communicate effectively with community members and bringing things to them that are going to make them proud of their city, but as well, like putting in educational pieces like museums and schools and technology like escalators to just improve the overall. That's a really cool project. And I feel like that's applicable to even a lot of cities throughout the United States. Yeah. 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 Um, and that actually the collaboration piece was one of the lessons learned. She brought up, she said the collaboration was key to making this happen, not only between the people who were planning this, but the collaboration between the people who were 
doing all this stuff and the gang members, the collaboration between the project people and the community. They, they incorporated the community. And that's that's another important point that we'll bring up a little bit later when we talk about Ron Davis's speech. But the only other point that she made was that the tech, the technology that was involved, the escalators, the museums, the everything else, that was a means, but not the end. Right. The end was still focused on the citizens and and how how to improve their lives not necessarily what technology was used but um but how to improve it yeah and i think that's an applicable statement for everybody in the human factors field or in ux or whatever it is really if you're working with technology i mean i i really like this focus on the problem and i think that's something ingrained in me by like the science the science background right like you want to objectify what the issue is you're trying to solve and so really the technology is your is not really a means and it doesn't matter what you're necessarily using it's just how you solve the problem and what you have available to you so that's a that's an awesome talk yeah. man yeah i agree i agree um definitely uh was a good talk so after um after she presented then we had ron davis and uh, Ron Davis is – he was the keynote speaker. He was the executive director of Obama's task force on policing. So that's pretty cool to have somebody of that stature actually talking to us. Um, and uh, his his talk was on policing reform versus police reform and what the difference in uh, in that, that, that kind of verbiage meant. And, um, you know, when he got up there, he kind of said, well – you know, when I first was invited to do this talk, I I looked and saw what you guys did and said, well, what does this have to do with human factors? And then he kind of realized that it has everything to do with human factors, right? Um, the failure to understand these systems is the reason we have problems. He goes in to talk about how um, the pol- he gives a little background on the policing system and how there's 16,000 independent police departments across the USA. You know, there's no centralized police force. That's a thing that's unique to the USA, but it's also a challenge because there's no standardization across all the states, right? It's all um, kind of do what fits your needs. Uh, Which and he is goes on to talk about. Especially when it's such a big system. And it, I mean, I know it's run at a state level for sure but i would think that you would with something that big i mean because we're talking about sixteen thousand independent organizations that employ i don't know how many police per organization i mean that's a lot of people to not have a very like standardized rule set to follow or guides i mean i feel like that would be overwhelming yeah yeah it it really is and he goes on to talk about you know is it a profession or a vocation and he says well professions have standards so you, you put together two and two. Um, he, so that's policing reform. He talks about police reform in the sense of, you know, there's a focus on the police where, uh, you know, and it excludes the community that they're trying to protect. And that he gave an analogy. It's kind of like healthcare without the emphasis on patients, right? So <laughs> you're focusing on the healthcare providers, but not the people who need the healthcare. And it's kind of, he equated it to that's what the police system is right now is is uh, or that's what police reform is is when you reform police you're only reforming like half of the solution um gotcha so he's police... talking more about here like or for giving police specific parameters to operate under that are different from what's going on now and not really thinking about what's going on in their actual community community they're trying to do their job in is that what you're getting at yeah, versus policing reform, which is your focus on procedures that are involved with everything, you know. So um, he kind of brings up the idea of these controversial tapes, right? They pretty much always focus on the officer, but not the policy behind them. Um, there's this there's this thing in New York that was a uh, it was a policy for a while, which was stop, question, and frisk. Have you heard about this? Yeah, I've heard about this for a long time. And it's uh, it's interesting, again, to learn that this is not something practiced like widely because there's no centralized, I guess, police yeah. unit. Um, so that's that's even kind of more, I guess, frightening is that they're putting just specific practices like this stop, question, frisk in a centralized location based off of community need or felt like community needs. But yeah, I've, I've definitely heard of it before. Yeah. So with this, they were targeting people of color. Um, and it, 
you know, uh, when that happens, society blames police for being racist or they need additional training or whatever. But it goes deeper than that because um, it's it's strung throughout the system. Right. And and the stronger the system is, uh, the more likely these bad apples or officer misconduct will be rooted out. Right. And the, the, the argument is that the system just isn't strong right now. Um, and and it's, I, it, I think that entire point is really important for people to kind of like take a step back and have a retrospect on what's going on here. Um, because I do think often enough, I mean, there there's definitely going to be bad apples in every profession. And if you're a, if you're like a policeman or woman, you you get put in the spotlight, especially recently with it, with different shootings or racism that's rampant. But if they're if it's not just localized to people themselves, and if we only focus on that, I feel like we're ne- we won't be able to really tackle the systematic problems. Because this, what this sounds like, it sounds like some some governing body within this specific specific like police department put in this procedure, call it the stop question frisk one, and cops were told to follow that, and by following that, it had repercussions that nobody expected, but. You know, from right. a human factors perspective, we could catch potential things like that. I mean, in a process kind of driven environment. Um, but I'm Before curious. To, about, yeah. yeah. And I'm curious, did Ron Davis have really any kind of ways to tackle the systematic problem? Well, he uh, I mean, yes, but they were kind of weak, in my opinion. And that's not to say that this wasn't a, a, a completely compelling speech. So let me uh, keep going down here and then we'll get to his recommendations. Um, But he kind of talks about his perspective in terms of, you know, this whole tension between police and people of color. He is an African-American male. He's been in the police for 30 years and he's also a father um, that has to deal with this same kind of prejudice and uh, um, racism uh, directed at his children. And, um, you know, he uh, he kind of these things, and we look at the situation where they pull the trigger rather than the process leading up to it. That's kind of the same point we made earlier. He goes on to talk about this hard truth, and he made this thing very apparent. Right? We talked about how the system is broken, and um, but it's not. He he tells us the system is not broken. The system is working exactly as it was intended to, but it was built in the fifties and sixties designed to enforce Jim Crow laws, discriminatory laws, um, and that system is just residual. It's left over. It's it's something that we haven't reformed yet, and the system is working. It's just not, the, you know, it, yeah. It's it, it, He also described, like, yeah, we have better technology, right? We have these high-tech computers, but they're add-ons to the system. It's not a change to the system. Yeah, that's a really interesting point from his perspective. And, you know, I I wouldn't have had the insight to really think about it that way. But, I mean, if it's a system that's existed since about, like, the 50s, then, yeah, it has to go under, under like, massive changes to I mean, just to adapt to technology, much less the times and how they've changed. Um, it, that So that's a that's an awesome point that he made, that the system is working how it was designed to. And it I can only imagine really – the, how tough it would be to try and dive into something like the policing infrastructure, especially if we're talking about like 16,000 siloed um, police departments and how to bring them together and restructure the system. I mean, we have a hard enough time or I've had a hard enough time in my own profession trying to figure out how to sustain legacy systems and bring them into new technology, new processes, much less like try and deal with a, a systems of systems. And with regard to police. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I know we talked behind the scenes about 20 minutes, but we're having a good time. I'm, I'm okay to keep going. Uh, So he goes on to this. um, He he talks about justice and the whole metaphor of, you know, justice is blind. And he talks about the lady of justice and she is blindfolded. So why are you blindfolding a blind person? And, his whole argument is that the blindfold represents a system that is fair and free of bias. And when we're challenged, when we're faced with these challenges, we revert to the older systems. And, um, so he, he kind of ended it out with, um, 
his uh, his recommendations and committing to fighting for justice. He, he kind of said, you know, stand up, speak out, kneel, do whatever you want. The only unacceptable thing to do is to remain silent about what you want changed. And I thought that was really powerful. Um, he goes on to talk about some recommendations here. He goes, I'm going to borrow a phrase from millennials and say, stay woke. Um, <laughs> when I saw that, I could not help but just laugh a little bit because that's just an awesome one to use. I know. Yeah, it's uh, it's relevant, though. And he says, you know, ex- ex- accept the responsibility. Um, it, you know, it's it's our responsibility to stand up, speak out, all that stuff, educate and inform others about what's going on. It's what we're doing here on Human Factors Cast. All of our listeners now know about this. Uh, take action, collaborate with others. And that collaboration kept coming up. Um, he goes on to talk about uh, – the two different versions of America, which tied in really nicely with Nancy Cook's speech. He talks about uh, U.S. law enforcement versus the people that are trying to protect um, and kind of says sides of the same coin, but it's two separate peoples. That may, yeah, I mean, that makes complete sense, right? I mean, because how do you, I don't know. I've always felt like even since I was a kid, there was a separation between the two. Um, and I, I don't, I don't know when I, where I was raised and where I grew up. I mean, when you saw a police car coming, you were, it, I don't know, it gives you like a jolt of fear is like, why is that even here? Or what's going on? Um, so there's right. an element of fear that's like associated with law enforcement that I, I feel like it's hard to break that tie either between the fact that it is like somebody enforcing the law and, you know, our past history with, various violence and what's going on in the social climate nowadays. So I can, I can imagine this being very true. And I think it's, I think it's important to also remember that that's not every police officer and there is plenty of great men and women out there. Yeah. 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 I mean, this, this speech was really powerful and I am 100% glad that I attended this. This was something that uh, I was kind of met on when I saw it on the uh, session uh, information page and and man am i glad i went it was just it was a really good speech and uh he's so well spoken and it's it's no wonder obama appointed him to uh lead his task force on um uh police reform so uh so that that was it for the two speeches they went on to uh talk about awards and all the fellows and all that stuff at the opening session there uh the only noteworthy thing to me at least was that the human factors prize went to an article on hacking the human uh specifically pertaining to cybersecurity. so that goes back to that whole big talk last year at hfes and it's a it's a nice tie back to say hey look if you do research on the things that we call attention to at these things, you're likely to win a prize if it's good. So, um, and that's that was, a big deal, was, especially in the community, but to like have it on your CV or sitting on your website that you want a prize, especially in this case, cause I'm seeing so many cybersecurity programs popping up across universities. This is, this is great. Oh, to yeah. See. yeah, 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 for sure. So after that, um, Let's see here. I went to uh, the usability testing methodology, and I could only duck in for one presentation here. Um, but I did duck in for uh, the not to evaluate effects of clothing equipment on mission performance. Um, so this was looking at uh, dynamic markman- marksmanship evaluation methodology. So what that means is they were basically looking at how effective are you at being able to shoot a gun while you have all this encumbering stuff on you. Um, Which you know, is super past, relevant they, for a lot of like military personnel, I would assume, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they've In the past, they've used these live fire marksmanship uh, tests for testing. Uh, and in this study, they where they, um, you know, they, they're able to manipulate the amount of targets. So in, in this specific study, they did one target, four static targets and four dynamic targets that moved, as well as they were able to vary the equipment and encumbrance levels and also what kind of positions they were in. So standing, kneeling, and prone. And um, this whole uh, this whole thing was aimed at, uh, you know, early developments prior to acquisition so you don't have to to uh, put them through the ringer, so to speak, uh, after they're already created. 
Wow. So I'm not sure if they really brought this up during the talk, but I mean, is the reason that they decided to get away from the live firing marksmanship testing and opt for using a simulation in this case because they had a lot more control? Because it looks like they were able to like vary equipment and encumbrance levels as well as position using simulation. Uh, and I feel like it, I feel like you maybe you lose fidelity, but this allows a researcher to get like probably more. Um, more detailed data and very specific depending. Yeah, on I think that was part is. of it. I, yeah, I think that was part of it. And I think um, the other part was uh, the whole fact that the live fire testing is really expensive to run. Uh, there's a lot of logistical nightmares to go through because it is fire. So I think just another way that they can do this. It, it's kind of like uh, doing a prototype, if you will, um, in software development, it, it's to me, it kind of screams the same equivalent where it's cheaper to do and easy to manipulate. Cool. Now, Nick, you've got like a, another panel topic down here that I'm really interested to hear you talk about related to the power grid. Yeah. So this was at the system development, um, panel and, uh, this one I was able to stay all the way through. Um, and I'll just go through these one by one, uh, Wow, we're already at 30 minutes. I can't believe that. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I was sitting here. I was like, you know what, Blake? We'll just we'll try to make this 20 minutes. And But, you know, I'm having a good time. I don't care. It's a bonus episode, whatever. I'm, I'm happy our listeners get to kind of peek in. Like, I'm, I'm really glad we actually didn't pull in a guest for tonight. Otherwise, this would have gone forever. Okay, so let's talk about this uh, North American Power Grid. This is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart, only because I have uh, a little bit of experience working in the field. And, um, you know, the, the, the North American power grid is that it's, it's vast and, and uh, everything pretty much affects everything, right? So something in Florida, if, if something happens in Florida, it could affect what happens in New York. And same thing on the West Coast, California will affect Washington, and vice versa. Um, and, you know, and you have sort of these major electrical power control centers that monitor this data. Um, and there's, you know, phaser measurement units and other buzzwords about how power flows. But basically the, the point of this talk was how do you make this data understandable so that operators can make these decisions accurately and timely, um, you know, and, and, uh, and, and make the right ones. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm imagining that if we're talking about something is complicated or sa sounds complicated is like phase or measure measurements and then what that means especially if we're because i honestly didn't realize that the grid can affect uh like if you're if something's affected in florida it might hurt washington and california as well so that's got like a lot of decision implications so data visualization has got to be a really big deal for these guys yeah it was actually one of their methodology they've looked at data visualization they they took surveys they looked at focus groups and what they found mixed with the new things there's no standardized displays for this stuff you know they need to consolidate some the entire wait i lost you for a sec there yeah you cut you... out uh from about the too many old things being mixed in with the new. Um, and I did hear that you s said there's no actual standardized displays. I'm kind of surprised, especially in something that really leaves leaves like a power structure so vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They, they validate some of these tools that they use. They need to take kind of that holistic view of uh, the power grid to really take everything into account. And... Um, you know, a lot of their day-to-day -day activities, surprisingly, are just acknowledging alarms. Look, something happened. Okay, great. Uh, react to it. Um, and oh, man. what they I, were... I got, like, a bad feeling that a lot of, like, just typical signal detection problems fall into that category of day-to-day -day activity. Oh, for sure. Use, you know, things like cluster. You know, some of the design principles they wanted to implement for this was to kind of bring these overview displays and make them visible from everywhere within these control centers. Um, so that way everyone on the floor can see them, but, you know, then also have your own kind of workstation as well. Um, and they to get at that reactive Alarm, you know, the, the alarm comes in and they react to it. They wanted to go into the proactive part and say, well, 
what can we do before the alarm even goes off? Um, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and even though, like, having an overview display, I know that gets really tricky, especially if you've got multiple operators that focus on so many different things, especially, let's say, if the uh, overview display still encompasses a lot of information. I mean, that's, again, a big-time data visualization problem that you could, like, at a glance pick out what is necessary that you need maybe to make a decision or to have in your head so you can make a proactive de decision before an alarm goes off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and so what they did was they tested different prototypes with various scenarios, so things like faults, earthquakes, and what I thought was interesting was cyber attacks and terrorism on the U.S. power grid, and I'm glad they included those. So their solution basically was a, uh, a separate screen focusing on rate of change rather than the raw data. Uh, otherwise, it's information overload. Yeah, that may, and I think that makes sense. And I'm definitely with you on the, I'm glad they tested for cyber and terrorism as well, because, I mean, there's been a lot of books that have been coming out recently about the vulnerabilities of the power grid, especially related to cyber and terrorist attacks. So understanding how to make quick changes based off of whatever interfaces and data you have available is definitely a step in the right direction if there's no standardization for these things. For sure. Um you know, I'm going to start glancing over these, and let's just dig into something if we if we find it interesting. There's sure. one in particular that I think you'll find interesting. But uh, this this panel was really good. Um, next up uh, was a comparison of alternate human viewpoints and frameworks, and I'll just kind of glance over this. But there there's different human viewpoints uh, in terms of architecture frameworks, right? When you think about architecture frameworks, they are sort of these varying perspectives of a system, right? You have like services and product management and hardware, but the humans are missing. If you, if you think sort of these concept diagrams where you have, you know, hardware communicating with each other, like you have the planes communicating with the ships that are communicating with the drones, the human view, like pilots, drivers, and operators in those diagrams, um, and uh, this whole this whole uh, talk here was kind of comparing two of these things, which was the um, the uh, there's two different viewpoints of the human perspective. There was the NATO version and the MODAF version, which MODAF is Ministry of Defense Architecture Framework, um, and but neither of those have been adopted by either the uh, Department of Defense Architecture Framework, which is MODAF or the Ministry of Defense, which just for everyone's awareness is is um, U.S. and uh, UK? across the pond. Uh, yeah, yeah, U.K., there you go. Uh, sorry, it's a brain dead over here. Um, the comparison part was that they are similar but different. The NATO version is focused more on human performance modeling and analysis. They do a lot of work with Imprint, which is a task analysis uh software. I've had the pleasure of working with Imprint. Um, <laughs> and then there's Modaf as well, which is uh, that that version uh, also takes into the human per, uh, human perspective, but it aligns with tools and how humans use tools in this framework. Um, you know, and, and the bottom line is that both of these have value, uh, but and you use it in analysis, but there's some confusion as to um, which models are being used. Uh, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, too, and especially how we're talking about, like, the humans kind of out of the loop. And I'm going to tie this back to Ron Davis's point of these are systems and architectures that were probably developed a long time ago. And we didn't worry as much about anything but how are the machines going to work? Are they going to work together and how do they have to work together? And now I think we've come to a point where, where our technology is caught up so well that we can really focus on the variables produced by human behavior within these complex systems. And so reworking um, these architectures to really include human perspective, like it seems like NATO's done, sounds like the right or a move in the right direction. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so the next one, uh, some of our colleagues, former coworkers for you and my colleagues, uh, current coworkers, uh, did the HSIF, which is the uh, Human Systems Integration Framework. They define basically what HSI is and how it's integrating the human with a system. Uh, that's very high level, <laughs> but uh, they they kind of illustrated how it works in the DoD lifecycle and um, you know 
it, they talked about how HSI practitioners kind of compete for resources when it comes to acquisition programs, and uh, the practitioners tend to be just embedded within these things, and it, it doesn't really do much for them. Uh, and it's kind of hard to tell where these practitioners need um, different types of tools to uh, sort of help with the acquisition and HSI prog uh, process. What the HSI is, HSI framework is, is it is a web tool for conducting HSI within an acquisition lifestyle uh, or life cycle. Uh, sorry. And then, um, you know, they kind of talked about the, the evolution of the HSI framework. Um, and man, I like, even if I didn't work with these guys, I, th I thought this was a really impressive set of tools to kind of keep HSI practitioners on track with the right tools that they need at the right time with the right people. Like that is, it, it makes things really explicit for system engineers and, and even human factors engineers where they just, they need to know what they need to do. And this is a tool that will help them. Um, they actually gave a demo of, of this later on in the day. I did not attend that, but I know it was well attended and, uh, got some pretty positive reception. Yeah. And I mean, that makes a whole lot of sense because we battled <laughs> just tying it back to Nancy's points right earlier, like having to define the collaboration between multiple parties and being able to state the problem. Well, I think this kind of facilitates some of the, okay, this is what I do. And this is the process that I use within this acquisition framework. So this almost gives like a, a very nice bridge between multiple parties about how all this works in this life cycle and what needs to be done. It, I don't know. It just, it seems like a good way to communicate steps to be accomplished and give people like a common ground. That's what it sounds like from what I'm hearing. Sure. Yeah. Um, so moving on here, uh, the next one was interface of a bio inspired unmanned vehicle. Now, <laughs> when I heard, first heard that, I was like, what is that? What, what, what is that? And this one was probably the most interesting to me, not because of the content, but because of what a bio inspired unmanned vehicle is. And the fact that I didn't even know these things existed. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it kind of really distracted me from the rest because my brain was just going freaking crazy with information overload here. So these bio-inspired unmanned vehicles uh, are basically uh, robots that look like fish, right? So you, you could make a robot that's a dolphin, and it could be used for reconnaissance or um, you know data collection. Uh, and okay, so the name of one of these down here makes so much more sense, and so does the like notion of being bio inspired. I really just couldn't wrap my head around that at all in the notes. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, when I first looked at the thing, I was like, "What is that?" And and yeah, so it's it's basically a way to naturally camouflage your data collection. Uh, and man, was my brain going freaking wild with this. But uh, I had some sort of um, it's it's uh flexible um but the the problem with these is that there's a variety of different vehicles that you can control right you can control a dolphin you can control a tuna uh, whatever it is it's a it's going to be a different control mechanism and that they basically used eye tracking to look at this user behavior and and kind of looked at the differences between novice and experienced users uh in the context of tuna bot and so for this they used eye tracking um, and they used a statistical analysis on areas of interest on the screen. Um, and they also pulled apart some uh, most common patterns of eye movement um, that was resulting in recognition of what, what. Sorry, Nick, I think we lost you a little bit there. But yeah, I mean, that makes sense to be checking out how different saccades of eye movement uh equate to what people were recognizing i guess on screen it's and it's just blowing me away that there's something called tuna bot that actually has like reconnaissance utility that's just an awesome design i would yeah, actually and see one of these in person presentation that i was i was really impressed um and of course info like it's it's pretty straightforward um and and they kind of go into uh you know, let's let's combine some of these areas of interest on the screen to reduce the eye movement to save time for the operator. Yeah, I mean, that's like bread and butter human factors research, just making the operator's life a little bit more efficient as far as what they're looking at on screen. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. 
but in the context of bio-inspired unmanned vehicles, that's awesome. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, I want to drive yeah. a dolphin for a day. I'm just going to go sign up for that. That's so cool. Oh, thank you, JW Marriott, for our terrible internet connection tonight. I, I was asking you, can I put that on your tombstone? I want to drive a dolphin for the day. Uh, yes, if I haven't been able to do it by then, I'll be real sad. But yes, you can put that on the stone. <laughs> okay, so the last one of that panel, the system development panel, was um, designing an automated agent to encourage alliance. And this paper actually received a couple of awards right right before they went on to experience. But they, they talked a little bit about uh, human reliance versus compliance, right, where reliance is when an alarm goes off, you rely on that alarm to alert you versus compliance, the alarm goes off and you respond to it. Uh, it was kind of cool to see that broken down. But uh, in this context, they they used a, um, a space navigator uh, tablet-based game where they tried to get the most points by landing ships on planets. And um, it's pretty simplistic. Uh, you know, it's just a 2D thing. But they basically created different agents, which are virtual assistants that um, help with different things, right? So trajectory drawing versus straight line drawing. Um, they had a step back, which is it detects a collision as imminent, and it steps back to avoid that collision. It will also route through the least congested areas and random pathways. Um, and those are the different agents that they employed in this study, and they they were looking at collision avoidance because that is how they measured reliance. Um, and there are two sort of components of collision avoidance. You have the detection of the collision and the avoidance of the collision. Um, so they basically took 24 participants to, um, you know, utilize these collision avoidance agents and use the straight line plus a combination of these uh, these other ones, the step back, the least congested, and the random trajectories, um, and manipulated reliability throughout the study, right? So as it was going on, they would – their goal was to avoid collisions, and so they would see these pathways and – um, if they trusted the system or, or um, relied on the system, they would 100% of the time, that's 100% reliance, and they would just keep trusting whatever. Uh, but as they re ability, the rely uh, the reliance goes down as well. So there's there's a lot here. It's kind of hard to break apart talking about it. Um, and uh, But it was a really good presentation. They talked about it. Go ahead. Uh, that's just a really interesting point because I mean I know I, I think she's there. One of the one of your current colleagues and one of my former is did a lot of research in trust and automation, and this sounds like a little bit of a a new distinction of really talking about compliance and reliability and getting at the construct of rea reliability and what does that really mean based off what we're seeing. Uh, so it's a, this is a really cool thing you might want to i don't know if i wonder if tina actually saw this this would be an interesting thing for you to talk to her about but anyway i mean uh, she, she actually chaired the session so she oh, was of there course. yeah that makes perfect sense <laughs> yep 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 happy family uh so um so just about some of the future applications right was this really reliance that they were measuring um they want to further parse out the difference between reliance and compliance and they want to test this out in other areas right um so uh that was it for the systems development um uh, to round out my day i uh, went to the poster session and uh, met with some really nice folks oh thank you jw marriott for our shoddy internet connection um <laughs> that tonight so uh yeah i ended up the night uh with the poster session i met with some really nice people um some of the posters that stuck out to me was uh this one called vr what eat and i thought it was a <laughs> that is an excellent pretty... title <laughs> uh yeah i i just had to uh meet the author of that one because uh the title was so good but um it was kind of looking at how can we use vr as a persuasive technology and they used it in the context of 
um, not necessarily converting someone to veganism, but to understand the perspective of vegans and, um, you know, would you eat a cow if you embodied a cow? That, oh, <laughs> this kind of thing. okay. I see what they're doing there. Yeah. Geez. That's intense. Uh, I have the paper. I haven't actually read through it yet. Um, but, uh, the author was very nice. Um, and that's G a song from uh, university of central Florida. I also talked to a couple other ones about, uh, resume displays, which like, you have you ever seen those graphics, uh, on a resume and wondered, are they effective? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Like, um, the graphs on, on like my skill set with, uh, Adobe illustrator is super oh, yeah, kind of like your provision or how proficient you are with a specific tool type of graph. Yeah. They kind of broke this down and said, you know, was this, uh, what, what, method and the context was within uh your your principal um you want to hire a sixth grade teacher or something and and uh i believe the results were it doesn't they they prefer the traditional but you know we had a nice discussion about you know does this transfer over to um something where you'd have like a design job right would it be more preferable to have something where you're trying to hire a designer and you can see these visual aids so that's that's the next steps and then uh, i also talked with um oh boy i don't have her card dang all right anyway i talked about uncertainty visualizations and and how that uh we had a nice chat about how to display uncertainty on a map and uh temporal um sort of representations of uncertainty and how you break that all down but yeah there were a lot of great posters out there tonight I want to thank everyone for, uh, for, for being such a great sport and, um, presenting today. Like it, it was, uh, I, I love this community and everyone did such an amazing job today, chairing the sessions and holding everything together and, uh, presenting on their posters. So just c- big congratulations to the entire human factors community. It was a really great day at HFES. It sounds like it, man. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast for a second day in a row and just breaking it down. I know it, I'm a little bit selfish because I know it's really helpful for me and I love hearing about it. And I hope the listeners get a kick out of it, too. It's a great bonus for everybody. I hope so, too. Uh, Blake, you want to do this tomorrow? <laughs> yes, let's just do it every night this week or every night that you feel up to doing it. Maybe not Friday night because I'm actually traveling, but we'll we'll see. I I, I think I can do it tomorrow and uh, potentially Thursday night as well. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, go ahead and hit that thing. I, I'm gonna wrap it up. That's it for today, everyone. What, did you guys like our bonus episode? Did you guys, if you were here at HFES, did you guys see something interesting that I missed? Because I know I missed a ton of it out there. There's a lot of stuff. Let us know. You can follow us all over social media. Head on over to our uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can always talk to us on our SoundCloud, uh, or you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com if you have any tips about where we should be tomorrow or Thursday. That's that's a good way to reach us. You can also leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing, you can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. And always, 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 I love it when you guys like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is, uh, because that helps us grow. And, of course, you can always reach us on our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you for hanging out with me tonight and helping me break down all this stuff that I needed to unpack. Where can our listeners find you if they want to know more about you and hang out with you online? Oh, for sure. And thanks for having me on for this, Nick. This has been a lot of fun. So you can find me at Don't Panic UX on Twitter if you want to get in touch. Excellent. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter or here at uh, Human Factors and Ergonomic Society in Austin, Texas this week. Uh, on Twitter, I'm uh, Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast, guys. Until next time, I guess tomorrow, it depends. It depends on tomorrow's stuff. It depends on tomorrow's stuff. Oh, my God. Oh, Blake, I'm so tired. I'm going to end every podcast this week with I'm so tired. 